Hello. Do you like the world we live in? I think you should, because you managed to get a ticket to uh, Riga TEDx. Uh, but more seriously, if we compare it to today, don't you have that feeling that just 10, 15 years ago, world was a bit more stable, it was more predictable, people were not having these extreme views. Politics was boring. Right now, you hear everybody talking about doomsday coming, how crazy things have become. But if you think of it, and you look at data, the only difference is the world has become faster. It is not worse place to live in, but we have that feeling. We are anxious. We're feeling that something is going wrong. Why is that? That is because the way we process information has changed. Think when you're thirsty, what do you do? You take a glass of water and you drink it. If you are still thirsty, you drink it a little bit more. But now imagine when thirsty, you're pushed in a big, big lake. In a way, there's so much of drinkable water there, but if you don't know how to swim, that doesn't matter, you start drowning. And that is what happens with the information. We all need information. We're social beings, we thrive on knowing what happens around us. But right now, this information is so abundant that we are like small, small human being in a big, big lake. And I would tell you, we don't know how to swim there. How it all came around? Well, because I believe we're undergoing one of the most profound shifts in the information consumption habits that uh, humans have ever had. And that is because of this device. I think all of you here have one. You most likely get your information from that device Steve Jobs brought to us a little bit more than 10 years ago. Think of it. It's, it's all the time with us. Just 10 years ago, what would be your normal interaction with news? Those who remember in the audience. <laughs> well, first, it would be morning newspaper. Vienna, Financial Times, Allgemeine Zeitung, Le Monde. Make your pick. Then, during the day, radio news, or for really advanced, the internet news. And then at the end, during after the dinner, uh, evening TV, uh, evening news, panorama rather. And that was it. That gave you kind of decent understanding what haps, happens around you. Right now, it's all the time with you. Remember the last time you scrolled through the Twitter newsfeed, Facebook? This morning, 10 minutes ago? I know some people for whom the first thing in the morning they see is that device, and the last thing they touch before the night is also the sm their smartphone. I see you have the knowledge of same people, of s similar kind of people. So what happens is, we see so much news, but we don't see it. We don't see what the fact is. Microsoft research back from 2015 said that average attention span is eight seconds. Eight seconds. Can you really understand the information if you're just looking at it for eight seconds or able to focus on eight seconds? I would say sometimes when I look at my Twitter feed myself, I think, Eight seconds is generous. I think it's like two. But I still get some kind of impressions. I get the feelings. So the problem is, in these eight seconds of perpetual information, we never really look at what is a fact. Why somebody is saying something? Why there is such a conclusion? Back in 4th century BC, Aristotle, 
in his rhetoric said that humans are convinced by three things, logos, ethos, and pathos, logic, authority, and emotion. And already then, people understood that emotion is by far, by far the most important and most powerful one. Especially now, when we are living the worlds of attention span of eight seconds. In eight seconds, you can't really understand the logic of a thing. You can't really get to the root of the problem. And problems tend to be complex. They're not simple. But you still get the information. So what do you do? You get emotionally. And that is a kind of preconceived element for humans. We are emotional. So if somebody presents us emotional information, that is powerful. That is powerful. That is the way we remember things. Emotions touch deeper than something that would be complex explanation of complex problems. So that is now the environment where we act upon emotion and instinct. And that is not something that you can build a society that is inclusive, that listens to other, other voices. Because emotion is also contrarian quite a lot of times. So last year, Facebook made a revenue worth of $10.3 billion. I assume most of you would be Facebook uh, consumers. What is the last time you paid to Facebook? Well, most of you probably never. How do they make that money? It's of course because of ads. But in a perverse way, you would think of that they are selling you. You are the product of Facebook or other social media companies. So what is their interest then? Their interest is to keep you there as long as possible to sell you as much as possible. Clear business logic. But then comes a twist. What makes you stay? Well, if you're happy, you stay. So the algorithm is looking what makes you happy, what makes you stay. And happy does not necessarily mean correct information, right information, something that is makes you happy, something you agree with, and something that you engage with. That is something that is emotional. So in a way, they try to understand your brain and feed it what it has already as a preconceived idea. What happens then? People increasingly and increasingly are becoming part of bubbles where they just see the things according to them. World according to Yanis, to John, to Linda. But in that world, you increasingly cannot hear others. Well, that was just uh, one month ago we had elections here in Latvia, you remember, yeah? So, so many of my friends said they can't believe the results and outcome of that election because everybody in their Twitter, Facebook bubble would vote in one or another direction. And that is, I think, a good snapshot of the power of bubble. Both we are relating to people in a similar sort of mindsets, but also algorithms keep us feeding the same information. And here the cognitive biases come in, and they, we become convinced. World just have one color. Others don't exist. Other opinions don't exist. Or if they do, they are wrong. And that is, in my view, a dangerous proposition. Another interesting thing in these eight seconds of uh, attention spans is how we make a choice what is right or wrong. Who's met an online robot? Not many? Oh, few. Well, I reckon most of you have. You might have not recognized. In fact, in the online environment, there are lots of robots. Well, some are good. They bring the news, they bring what you were asking for to bring on a particular time. 
but some are not as good. I would want you to meet Naomi. She's a robot, and she's for hire. So how robots work online? So if you, of course they can amplify things, make things trending on the digital space, but I think more sinister is when you have this news item that appears on your scroll. How do you make a judgment? Is it right or wrong in eight seconds? And in fact, interestingly, your brain is wired to make that decision for you. And one of the ways it is being d processing it, are there any other sources saying the same thing? So if multiple sources say, I'm good, you should listen to Yanis, you're most likely to believe, yeah, then something there is that Yanis is saying right thing. Or the others would say, no, he's absolutely dumb, hate him. And if the 20 people would say the same thing, well, yeah, probably I should be very wary of him. So that is kind of trying to convince and instill ideas into humans' brains. So these robots are not singular. There are many and alike. So they typically come in networks. And interestingly enough, sometimes people ask, is it really a problem? Well, I can tell my institution, we look for these robotic networks. And in the first half of 2017, when we look, who talks about NATO in Latvia, in Twitter, and first we looked at Russian, and the number of robotic tweets was 85%. So in the conversation, there are basically no humans. But if you go in, and well, if you were Russians from somewhere outside, come in, oh, what the Russians uh, in Latvia think of NATO? Wow. So it is really important to remember that you might be not seeing the human, but somebody trying to trick you into believing that's a human. Then, the big thing in the room, this is a data. And this is the cover of The Economist that recently said that's the most valuable resource. How? Why? How these data crumbles that you leave online all the time, how it is so valuable? Well, because that makes somebody who collects and process it understand so many things. And amongst them, also you as human in a very detailed way. I would claim better than your mother, your wife, or your child, or your husband. And when you have that kind of information, what do you do? Okay, you can sell things, because you know what would get ticking that particular person, and what moment to do that. But you can also instill ideas, and you can instill behaviors. So if somebody said, if you're not photographed uh, and your boss will not be able to tell that you've been here, I can tell you, if your boss has a good big data analysis capacity, he'll be able to tell you're here. In fact, we recently run an experiment, which will be published later this year, where we tested. Can you get to know about the person you never know, never met, just by the online data? Well, who he is? what he does for a living, telephone number, home address, uh, family status, children, family quarrels, with whom he cheats his wife, what is his beliefs, how much he spends, is there issue with his funding or financing, etc., etc. And that is all out there, collectible. Do you believe that based on that, one can instill behaviors? Well, I would tell you easily. And that is increasing the world we're entering in, where the big data, artificial intelligence in combination, start to present a possibility for someone who might be interested to make big, big impact upon society, upon up to the point where they can instill ideas in the brain and make you do what they want to do. So, I'm not here to sort of scare you, <laughs> but I'm really here trying to warn you. We as a humankind have meddled through worse situations, but we have to work to do that. So, 
First thing that we have to really do is, if we find ourselves in that big, big lake as small human beings, we have to learn to swim. It strikes me paradoxical that we claim to live in an information age, but we don't equip the society and citizens with the skills to exist. How to tell what the information is what? How to tell when somebody is trying to manipulate you? How to tell when the emotion is used to, to get you really angry and act upon certain instincts? That is something we have to know as societies or else we'll be in trouble. Second, we uh, have fought for a long time to have rights. Rights as citizens, rights as, as individuals. It strikes me that in the online environment, we suddenly are losing our rights. I think it is my right to know when I am dressed by a bot or a human. I think it is my right to know when somebody, by using my big data, is trying to instill an idea in my head but I wouldn't be able to tell. Even me, with an institution that is specializing to understand this whole phenomenon, we can't always understand what is happening. And I think that is one of the fundamental rights we have to strive for and create a bill of digital rights. For those in a technology world, I think that is also important to remember when you develop a new technology, it's like Alfred Nobel uh, developed dynamite. Yes, you can build roads, you can build tunnels with that, but it can kill people. You have a responsibility when you develop, like Zuckerberg had a responsibility when he developed Facebook to make sure that people are safe within that platform and it cannot be used for manipulation. And last and most important, I think the thing that has carried us through the centuries and put our societies on path to success has been one single thing that is very important for a human, but yet, time and time again, we're not using that basic skill. And that skill is to think. Thank you.